Welcome to the Data, AI, and Everything podcast, where we delve deep into the world of data science and artificial intelligence in each episode. We engage with leading experts and visionaries who are at the forefront of transforming the landscape of data and AI. Join us as we unravel the complexities and envision the future and experiences from our distinguished guests. On today's episode is the first part of a three-part series focusing on leveraging AI to help solve financial inclusivity for underbanked and unbanked groups. We'll focus on the microeconomic factors that could prohibit certain groups, especially women and women-led businesses in the ASEAN region, from accessing official sources of financing. It may not always be the data. There are cultural and societal obligations, behavioral science, and financial literacy elements that can disadvantage a particular group. Whether you're a budding entrepreneur, a finance professional, or someone passionate about social equity, stay tuned as we delve into this topic. I'm your host, David Pan, heading up AI derived credit scoring here at Avoitis Data Innovation, a leading data science consultancy within the Avoitis conglomerate. With me today is Rosalia Kital, founder and CEO of Dixie, a financial platform aimed at helping women take control of their finances and live the life of their dreams. Welcome, Rosalia. Could you share with our listeners the inspiration behind Fixie and what got you started? Yes, happy to. Thank you so much, David, and to the Aboitas Data Innovation team for having me on this podcast. We have long worked together and because we're both so passionate and absolutely committed to financial inclusion. So it's I'm happy to be on this podcast. I'm really grateful to be invited to it because what we're really doing is just amplifying this need to bring in more people into the finance fold and to also highlight that technology, especially AI, is creating opportunities to really make it such that every single person should be involved in finance. And so that's really our mission at Bixie. We really focused on the unbanked and vastly underbanked, which unfortunately comprise women. And it's not just the majority of women. It's about 99% of women are just not engaged, are not actively engaged in their finances and making money off of their money. And this is a problem because we live in a system called capitalism, where capital accrues from capital, right? So if you're not actively making capital off your capital, you are actively losing and missing out. And so we focus a lot on getting women to feel more confident about their financial choices so that they can start really engaging in building a financial portfolio, which on first glance seems super intimidating. But the reality is it's really accessible because of technology. So the inspiration for starting Bixie really came from A, my own personal life experience and B, my own ignorance. So my personal life experience was my mother was a Filipino overseas foreign worker. So she's from a very small town in the north of the Philippines. My grandparents are and always have been rice farmers. And so she moved to the U.S. to become a nurse. And unbeknownst to her, when I was very young and she was only 35, she was diagnosed with terminal cancer. And it was really just thanks to one interaction that she had with a fellow Filipina nurse who, before she was diagnosed, said, hey, you should really buy this investment product, which was life insurance. She bought it and unfortunately she passed away. But because she had the foresight at such a young age, me and my two sisters were able to use our life insurance policy, leverage that and end up getting world class education. I was able to pay for my undergraduate degree, leverage that into a scholarship for my master's and then ultimately become an attorney. So I think sometimes we don't real we think investments is this an afterthought. But particularly if you are a woman or a person with family, it should be the first thought. And there's so many different types of investment. You don't need to go straight to crypto, right? Like just basic insurance, maybe a couple of stocks in the form of an ETF, all of those things really do add up and can safeguard your family for truly generations. So that was my personal experience when I really realized like, wow, this investments are your security. And then my own ignorance, I was in my mid 30s. I had already had a career as a private corporate attorney in New York. And I had at that point been working for almost 10 years for the United Nation. Everything seems great. Everything's really cushy. But of course, I'm a person like many people, like many women and humans that I meet. We have many dreams. We didn't. We have a lot of dreams. We have a lot of ambitions. We have a lot of visions. 
And my vision was honestly to create a company like Bixie after I'd been working all over the world in over 20 countries. And I, I, I sat down and I was like, OK, let's look at my financial situation, because here's what people don't talk about when they see the visions of like entrepreneur. Being an entrepreneur is expensive. Being an entrepreneur is costly. It is not worth doing if you can't dedicate at least full time three to five years. So that's three to five years where you don't know if you're going to be making money. So you have to be able to afford it. And so I sat down with my finances and I thought, oh, my gosh, after a really like technically on paper, financially successful career, my stuff was in a disorder. <laughs> like I had student loan debts. I had some random mutual fund that was just getting cannibalized by fees. Like I did. I was I was doing all these things wrong despite having a master's, a Juris Doctorate, all of these things. And when I looked around, not only at my peers, but then the evidence that showed I was in very good company. And since I started Bixi, I cannot tell you how many times a senior vice president in an investment bank DMs me after our conversation and says, oh my gosh, I'm in the same position. Like I, I have a, a random mutual fund, maybe a checking account. Because the reality is women, 75% of women's assets is cash which as we know with inflation is just dying, right? Like you're just losing money. So those were the kind of personal and deeply personal motivations for me to start Bixie because I saw the, the benefit and I saw the need from women all around the world, regardless of education level and income level, we need to take control of our finances and we need to start being active investors in our own life in order to live the life of our dreams. All right. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. It's very insightful. What I guess in your experience then, and after spoken to, speak to others, and what are some of those factors that are preventing women or from accessing these official sort of financing sources or even looking into finance and yeah. why are they holding, what do you think why they're holding 75% in cash with amongst their yeah. assets? Yeah. So these are actual, these are, so now the evidence, so I did my master's in behavioral economics way back in the day when this was considered a fringe science, but now is absolutely in the fold. We focused on trying to understand why people make bad decisions, right? People know they shouldn't smoke. They know they should go to the gym. We know all these things, except we all end up doing it, right? It turns out we have a lot of just knee-jerk behaviors, right? Some of them are psychological, but it really distills down to perception. We tend to perceive certain things. We tend to over perceive our present and under perceive our future, hence why we don't invest. We tend to overestimate risk and underestimate rewards in certain contexts, except when it comes to gamification, hence why that really plays a role. Mm -hmm. So there's all of these things regarding perception, but specifically to win women. So there is data and evidence to suggest that there are gendered distinctions. So number one, women have lower confidence when it comes to money matters. This was published. This was a huge study, one of the old, like a seminal piece of work published in 2021. The Financial Times ran with it as well. Basically, here's the linkage. Women lack confidence and they lack confidence because they think they lack knowledge. Again, perception. Because when you look at the global financial literacy scores globally, women are only two deviation points behind men. Mm -hmm. Whereas men tend to be overconfident so this is the difference between imposter syndrome, right, with women have and Dunder-Kruger with men have. And overconfidence actually does well when it comes to converting or taking an action towards investment. But when you look at ROIs, women's ROIs are actually higher, whereas men's are lower. So knowledge does play a role, but risk is really that that kind of confidence is really important to like take that first action, right? What is it, the, the Susan quote, like, first step is the hardest in a journey of a thousand steps, right? That's what we are unable to do. And so that's what Bixie really focuses on. It's looking at these behaviors, confidence and knowledge. So what by giving women more knowledge, we're not saying you don't know things. Actually, women know quite a lot. Right. It's saying, now let's get you in fighting order so that you can take that first step. And then there's a lot of these other really interesting quirks, like women have a tendency, and this is from the evidence, have a tendency to make financial decisions in consultation with other women okay. and not talking to a financial expert or even a robo-advisor, for example. So this is a really interesting quirk. Some of the literature suggests that this is straight cave behavior, right, where we had to decide how to allocate scarce resources. And so you see this behavior on super high income level women and super low income level women. 
And then you see this, what's also interesting is you see this all over the world in the form of these saving circles. Mm -hmm. My mother is Filipina. My father is Kenyan. I have lived in 20 countries. There's not a country in the world where a saving circle of women doesn't exist. And they all, they usually have some kind of like putting all their money in a pot and each person gets it at the end of the year. 192 countries in the world. I've been to a lot of them. I haven't seen a place once without that mechanism. So again, it suggests that this is how women interact with money as opposed to a, a very male perspective, which tends to go more towards course formalized and expert advice. I would also say another thing about behavioral science is you always have to look at the emotional impact of all decisions, right? So we think we're making all of our decisions here, but we're actually making a lot of our decisions from our emotions, right? So whereas men experience shame when they think about money, women experience anxiety. So just let that sink in. Shame versus anxiety. How do you alleviate shame? You provide confidentiality, secrecy, right? And look at the banking system, right? How do you alleviate anxiety? And there's a ton of evidence that shows that women experience it with, me with money and also with medicine. There's this one really fantastic case study that was done to address female mor uh, maternal mortality rates in the U.S., and by making small adjustments, knowing that this was an anxiety was the prevalent emotion, small adjustments like changing the lighting in the surgical theater, adding nice music, changing the smell from antiseptics to something a bit more soporific, they were able to reduce maternal mater mortality rates. Again, we're making, you have to, you, we're, we're not operating in a vacuum. We're not these personal, perfect, rational beings who are doing everything perfect all the time. We're emotive and we make a lot of emotional decisions. And so if we want women to take part in finance, Maybe we should consider changing the ambiance of your average bank or the ambiance of your average asset management company. Right. These type of changes would include more, 51%, frankly, of the population into the global financial process. Oh, okay. That's, that's very, well, I had ne never thought of that. You mentioned earlier on about gamification. Is that also, does that also help with the, the various psychologies in this? Absolutely. Gamification. So gamification, we use it to build confidence, right? So it's so we have we've tokenized our entire platform so people can or women who are lacking confidence rather than saying, hey, why don't you just give us a thousand dollars and just gamble it on investments? It's like, why don't you start this? Why don't you just play with it here? And then when you're getting more comfortable, these to you can start using real money in the real world to make these type of investments, because that's the thing. That first step is the hardest. But gamification, basically, it's like fake it till you make it. You can start playing, feeling more comfortable. And then eventually it starts to become your new behavior, which is, oh, I invest. And this is something that I do. And I can now feel confident to use my real money towards that. I see. I see. And coming back to this region, and based on what you've seen at ASEAN, do you think that there are any cultural or societal obligations that also plays a role in hindering financial access? A hundred percent. I mean, it's, I, at Vixie, we had um, one of our most popular workshops was called Family and Finances mm -hmm. because our first market is the Philippines. And as a Filipina and every Filipino knows the pressure, the familial pressure to share your wealth is intense. And can often be detrimental to your financial future. And this is the case, I think, with a lot of when Asian cultures, we, are, we do tend to be more communal minded, right? They're responsible for the generation ahead of us and the generation below us. But there does come a moment when the sandwich generation starts to self cannibalize, where you're not able to put away anything into savings or anything into investments because your third cousin once removed in the village needs braces. And so there is this intense pressure particularly from women, to support not only the immediate nuclear family, but my third cousin, twice removed, you know, from the village, that one of the things that we do at Bixi, which we highly encourage other fintech companies to do, is we provide an opportunity to have a little bit of secrecy around that. So we've done little unique like UX things like allowing if you open the app and it's integrated into an open banking system, you don't have to see your balance, right? Mm -hmm. Just making it such that they have their own safe space to begin building their finances and their investment. Because one of the challenges is, and I think a lot of our listeners can relate to this, is when we're very transparent with the entirety of the family, the phone calls don't stop. 
So one of the ways in which we suggest to our users, because you can't just not support your family, of course, we're not suggesting that at all, but you have to do it in a sustainable way. So it's equivalent, it would be the equivalent to religious tithing. You just know that 10% of your income is going to go to the family, but don't make it an ad hoc process such that you put that away and that's it. And anything above that, you have to learn how to say no. Because the ad hoc approach of every time somebody needs school fees or a hospital bill or this really will start eating into your livelihood and your savings in your future. But absolutely across ASEAN, it is an intense pressure that everybody feels. It's very interesting with what you've shared so far, because I have always looked at financial inclusion as a data driven problem. Speaking to lenders or those in financial services, the overwhelming theme has always been there's been a lack of data right, for particularly the underbanked to do various risk assessments. So it's a very, maybe it plays into the whole male dominated anxiety, shame type of mentality, right? Type of approach, because we're just looking for hard data points to, to, and trying to calculate our way out of this. But I think what you've highlighted is that the data approach neglects the human aspect of financial inclusion, because we're not looking at the behavioral psychological issues. So really solving the financial inclusion isn't just about lending to everyone that can, that, that you can lend to, right? It's just more about responsible borrowing behaviors and, and changing mentalities and helping, right? These, these groups and communities. So that, that's extremely interesting. But innovation and financial services, I feel you always, you're always going to face some regulatory challenges. Have you faced any of regulatory hurdles in the past before? And can you share a little bit how you've navigated around that? So at Bixi, we only, the financial products part is provided by partners at this outset because we specifically do not want to get in that air, in that realm. But ultimately, yes, as we grow and as we grow our data specifically on the world's fastest growing market in finance, creating our own products is something we absolutely want to do. And at that point, we would absolutely engage with the, the required regulators. But as I mentioned in my past life, I was an attorney. And in my current life, I'm still the attorney at Pixie. And I've been, I've acted in a judicious capacity for a number of fintechs in Asia. And so I can maybe speak to some of my ex prior experiences before Bixie, like one of the things that are contentious when it comes to regulation. I think number one, and you and I have spoken about this before, privacy and personal information. This is a window that is fast closing. The cowboy era of just hoover up everything and monetize it and sell it off. This is going to come to a close because we're seeing some of the detrimental effects of just willy-nilly putting all of our information, personal data everywhere for everybody to see. We know that internet scams and frauds are just at unprecedented levels. And when you put that within the context of financial technology, there's such an enormous temptation for bad actors to try and take advantage of that, that we, we have to be responsible gatekeepers for that, right? And we have to make sure that our platforms are responsibly secure the data information of our users. So I think that's one regulatory trend that I see closing. I think blockchain is going to play a big role in offsetting that a bit because blockchain obviously allows for precise tracking, deep personalization and protection of your private data. And But blockchain in itself brings a series of challenges from a regulatory perspective as well, as we've seen throughout ASEAN. We're, we're very lucky to be operating in the Philippines, in Thailand, where you have central banks that ha have always been very methodical and studious when it comes to blockchain. But a number of ASEAN countries are just like, oh, we don't want to deal with that. Let's just turn that off. But again, it's an inevitability. It's such a, it's such a unique and helpful technology. We know all the big banks are adopting blockchain in some iteration or another. So again, it's about being future forward and preparing ourselves for that. So where the challenge of data privacy is presented, I think there's a real opportunity for blockchain to maybe ameliorate some of these challenges. But I think the key in terms of tips working with regulators is work with the regulator. It's one of the cool things is you, you have to find the specific liaison focused on your issue. There's usually, in most of the good central banks, there's somebody who's in the fintech arm or the blockchain arm. Go to them. Tell them what you're working on. We've done that with the Central Bank of the Philippines. And often you'll actually find that they are a weird 
accelerator hub and they'll connect you to other other complementary organizations and companies doing something that could help your business grow. Also, it's a nice little vetting. It's, look, you're working with a regulator, sandboxing yourself and engaging with the regulator. I think these can all be, it can seem intimidating, but the reality is they are just human beings at the other end. And we're all trying to advance together. And almost every single government is interested in financial inclusion. So I think where there is a sincerity about the intent and a, a transparency with the attempt, I think we can work very well with regulators. And we, we have. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. I, I think, yes, it, it's all about working with the regulators. They have regulatory sandboxes, participating in those. Uh, it's, it's very important. Um, this technology evolves quite quickly. AI, uh, we've seen the advent of AI for a very long time, but in the past year with Gen AI, transformers and large language models, we've always, we've seen an explosion, right, of, of AI technologies. And then with blockchain, you, you mentioned that's, that's also quite interesting. So I can imagine this is really complicated for any regulator to try to, you know, stay ahead of and because the, the risk is simply too high, right? If yeah. not doing their jobs properly, then uh, the, the devastation on the society is, I think, it can be then great. Um, but speaking of blockchain, that's it's interesting because I, I feel like this year with the Bitcoin having in just a few days and the Bitcoin ETFs having been approved, so you, now you have a lot of institutional money flowing in and high tide raises all boats or rises <laughs> all boats. So I feel like blockchain has come back in a big way. Do you see Bixie adopting anything using this technology, tokenization? As you mentioned tokens earlier, so I'm not sure if Bixie has looked into this area in the past. Absolutely. So we have our white paper. It's available on our website, um, mybixie.com. I am a long time proponent, believer uh, in blockchain technology. I've personally been working in blockchain for blockchain companies since 2016. I wish I could. I only wish I'd start. I was an adopter back in 2010, mm -hmm. which just as a side note. So I went to university in California and somebody actually said, hey, do you want a Bitcoin? And I don't know why I didn't take it anyway. So life regrets. Yeah. Um, always be at the front of all technology. Lesson learned. So yeah, absolutely. The reason, and I don't, I don't just go with the ebbs and flows of blockchain. The technology is phenomenal. The technology works. It is entirely disruptive to finance and to so many other things, finance, digital identities, that it really was, it is for me and always has been just a matter of time. There's going to be a moment, an inflection point where we all wake up and every single one of our banks says, oh, actually, here's your new e-wallet, here's your new blockchain wallet and everything yes. is migrated. And knowing that this is already the case and having worked for large companies where this is already the case, we are absolutely future proofing. So we tokenized very purposefully you know, I see Bixie as becoming a global entity for women, a global bank, if not for women, where instead of four out of five of our dollars being spent in the general economy and us acquiring nothing, we spend four out of five dollars within our own economy. And having a token within our kind of she economy is a necessary component to our ultimate vision. Yep, since day one, I absolutely see Bixie as, you know, embedded in the blockchain world. We have our learn to earn is already active. So as mentioned, we have gamification for, you know, sticking to your financial plan, watching a video, listening to a podcast, playing a financial game. It's embedded across our platform. And I, I'm a huge advocate of it. And I think for me, a big part, particularly in teaching women about blockchain is to really separate cryptocurrency from blockchain. Everybody needs to do that. Cryptocurrency, hey, there's a place for it. Bitcoin is fantastic. Love it. But that is a high risk. We don't just jump right to that. But blockchain technology is really, it's unavoidable. And again, we're going to all wake up one day and look at our phones and everything's going to have migrated to the blockchain instead of like the Swift network. <laughs> yeah, I, that's a bad mouth, the Swift network. But I, I think, yeah, you're right, because blockchain technology, and actually I, I do have to bring Bitcoin into this because yeah. the, the Web3 purists, right, the ideology in Web3 is decentralized. Everything is decentralized peer to peer to avoid another catastrophe like in the Absolutely. financial crisis, 
right? So I think that's the promise. And it's great to see that interest is flowing back into the technology, into the, the coins. Not all the projects are the, the best projects that are out there, but you know, that I cannot be avoided at my own fault, those coins. But looking to the future and bringing this back into an AI podcast, and it can't be an AI podcast without getting your thoughts around Gen AI and large language models. So what are your thoughts on that? Do you see that benefiting Vixie anyway, or in the realm of uh, financial inclusion? Have you given this any thought? Share. Absolutely. So we have always, we've been integrating AI into the Bixie platform since day one. All of our, so the gamification, everything across our platform is we API into an AI software so that we can create a, a risk portfolio of each one of our clients, right? So we absolutely are using it for those purposes. How I personally feel overall about Gen AI vis-a-vis the female economy. So we know, and the evidence has been super clear, women do not respond to robo-advisors. So all of these pop-ups, oh, we can seek financial advice from a chatbot. It's unappealing for women. It will lend itself, I think, hugely to a lot of scams. And if anybody could predict investment on a chatbot, we'd all be billionaires. So I think that there's that component. I'm also Gen AI, a female economy, I think is also a little bit concerning. My biggest concern with large language models is that we learn this as attorneys, the past is not a predictive indicator for the future. Just because mm-hmm. something happened doesn't mean it's going to happen again. And the problem with large language models, it's largely, it's predictive based on the past. And so if you have a past where women didn't even have their own bank accounts in many OECD countries until the late 1970s, like 1978, 1980s, I can only imagine what a predictive generative AI would spit out in terms of female financial inclusion going forward. So I think there's a lot of work that has to be done in safeguarding the AI itself to be like, don't just pop out what happened, but figure out a way for progress. But even that, right when I said that, what does progress look like? And so in that regard, I don't see AI entirely replacing us anytime soon because the sentientness that makes the human experience as of this moment, so we think, is still lacking. We have to ask that one Google engineer who says otherwise. But yeah. so I think I think integrate aspects of it. It's really for me about managing efficiencies, especially as startups. We have to be really efficient with our time and our use and our resources. But I don't see it being a good robo advisor in the future. I don't see us using it for that. And I think we it's our responsibility to make sure that the predictive aspects really are inclusive and don't just spit out what the prior 200 years has created. Because, it, yeah, it's largely, it has to do with the training data, training yeah. points. Um, it's been incredibly insightful to discuss these issues with you, <laughs> and it's very insightful. I think as we wrap up today's episode, just wanted to see if there's one key message or takeaway that you think you'd like to share with our listeners. My key to every time I'm fast this, I always have two key takeaways. Okay. So the first one is do something today. Invest now. Do it really today. And it's not just a shameless plug for Bixie. If it's not Bixie, figure something else out. But time is always against you when it comes to your financial journey. I wish I had started at 20. I'd probably be fully retired at this point. So people always ask, when should I invest? I'm like, now, do something right now. And obviously, if you're interested, go to the Bixie app and check out some strategies to start now. But the key is really make it be like, okay, today I'm actually going to do something. And the second thing I always say to (laughs) the other piece of advice is, again, it has to do with time. It's really important. I always tell young women, they're like, what should I do? I'm like, freeze your eggs. No, but what that really means is don't think about your finances or data in a vacuum. Money is just a means to do whatever it is that you want to do, whether it's having a family, whether it's becoming a rap rapper. I don't know what you want to do, but if you want to do it, you need money. And never before in history has there been an opportunity to do all of this from your phone. If you just spend 10 minutes a day, learn a little bit about Dogecoin, as David mentioned, or learn a little bit about, uh, don't do that. No, but learn a little bit about whatever it is you want to learn about. Take it as an opportunity. Like you can completely transform your life and be able to do whatever you want to do. Um, But the key is to do something. 
Uh, so again, it goes back to what we talked about, that behavioral thing. The hardest thing to do is that first step, yeah. but you need to take it. Yeah. Take, take the first step. Start now. Yeah. Time is money. Boom. Thank you, Rosalia. Thank you. It's been wonderful to have you on the show, on the podcast. Thank you. Thank you to our listeners for joining us this week at the Data, AI, and Everything podcast. Make sure you visit our website at dataavoitsdatainnovation.com and subscribe. You can also find our show notes on the site. We hope you enjoyed listening and please share on your social channels as well.